Welcome to our study in Gideon's once again. Uh, we're in the book, book of Judges, uh, chapter 8. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 3. And uh, we're getting through Gideon. We're looking at his life. When we began this study, I wanted us to see uh, Gideon and just see the things that went on in his life and how he handled serving the Lord. And so here we are in lesson 10, our 10th lesson together. And uh, we're in Judges chapter 8. Uh, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 3 in just a moment. Actually, uh, we'll have prayer and then we'll read these verses together. So let me start out with having a word of prayer with you today. Uh, Father, we come to you today thanking you for another opportunity to uh, teach your word. Uh, for those that are following along in their Bibles and following along this series as we study, I pray you'd bless them. I pray, God, that you would help them to understand your word better and to know it and uh, be able to use it, God, to be stronger Christians and to stand closer to you. Now, Father, be with our church. Lord, you know our church is praying about selling our facilities, trying to look for a buyer. Uh, God, we pray that you'd send someone to purchase this place. And then, Lord, you know we're looking at the land in Callahan and we're praying over it to be able to purchase it. We're asking you, Father, just to be in the middle of all this and to take care of all this for us. Now, God, we want you to know we love you and we thank you, God, for loving us and saving our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Judges chapter 8. Let's look at verse 1 and let me begin reading there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus that thou callest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than that, <clears throat> better than the vintage of Ebezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Z. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. You know, in these verses, uh, they kind of show us something that I wanted to bring out in here. And really what I want to bring out and hopefully challenge you not to be like the Ephraimites, uh, but to be more like Gideon. Because what we find here is how easy it is for someone uh, who should be rejoicing with you over something that great has happened, or something good has happened, uh, how they become uh, upset or even oppose you uh, in this time. Uh, you know, when somebody, when something happens and uh, it's for somebody's good, we ought to be rejoicing with them. We shouldn't say, oh, why didn't you include me or why didn't you do this? Well, it's really a sad thing when a family member will do that. It's sad also when a church member uh, will complain or will gripe uh, because you didn't invite them or involve them in what you were doing sooner and all. Well, I kind of want you to see what I'm talking about today. So let's get to the scripture and let's start looking at the word and all. And again, I want to give you some more background. And from the background, I think that we can understand what this conflict was and all. Uh, let me take you back to Israel, the nation. Uh, remember, it was made up of 12 tribes. And um, then after Solomon was king, it divided into two tribes, into Israel and Judah. And in chapter 6 and verse 35, uh, you'll find that Gideon sent out messengers to all the other tribes. Whatever God called Gideon to stand up and to uh, stand against the Midianites and be that leader for Israel and all, uh, he got out and sent out letters. He said, I need help. So he sent messengers. He sent them out to these other tribes and all. And, and these messengers went out telling the tribes that Gideon was getting together an army. Uh, he said, hey, Gideon needs fighters, needs an army of men. Uh, we're going to try to stop these Midianites from coming down and stealing our food. They're down in the valley. They're getting ready to come in and take everything we've got, we've worked hard for. So I need your help. So Gideon sent that out. Now, let me remind you, all seven tribes, I mean, all 12 tribes uh, of Israel, all these tribes 
uh, knew uh, of the seven years, how for seven years the Midianites had come and robbed them and stole their crops, taken their food and uh, all. So all the tribes of Israel knew about it. In fact, the Ephraimites knew about this too. Now they act like in these verses that they didn't know about what was going on, but in reality they did. Here's how we know that they knew about it. Because whenever um, the Midianites came, those that were down in the valley ran to the hills. They would run up there. And guess who lived in the hills? The Ephraimites. That's why they didn't fight with them. They were children of Israel. They were all part of this Israelite tribe. And uh, they run, run up there. And so they knew what was going on. They knew the Midianites were still in their crops and robbing them and all. And so they knew all about that that particular incidents and all. Um, they knew that Gideon had put together an army to stand against the Midianites. He sent out word. He asked for help. And, and some of that word spread and it went around and all. And yet the Ephraimites did not get involved. Uh, they didn't help in any way. They stayed right there in their hills. They stayed up there. And uh, they were nowhere around when Gideon began uh, putting together his army and all. Uh, so we see that. Now, the second thing is Ephraim doesn't get involved. They don't get involved until after the main battle, after that evening where they surrounded the camp and uh, it, those uh, Midianites got scared because Gideon had had his men, those 300 men, bust those pitchers, uh, blow their shafar horns to scream out, and to uh, raise up that torch. And remember they got scared and they fought among themselves, killed one another, some ran off and all. And um, this is what happened that evening. That's what I'm calling the main battle. So after that main battle is over, it becomes daylight, it's the next day. Gideon's men have gathered back together. They're starting to chase after a group of these people. And uh, some of the Israelites, you remember God, is the one who brought Israel's army down to 300 men. Well, some of those men who in the beginning came out to be a part of the army and then later went home because God sent them home, uh, they came out there and helped with the fight. They began fighting. They began uh, taking all those strays, as you would uh, say, of the Midianites. And so as Gideon started out chasing these others and all of his 300 men, he sent messengers to Ephraim. And he asked for their help and all. The hard part was over. That evening when nobody knew what was going to happen, nobody knew if some of the Israelites would die or what was going to happen. They didn't know what God's plan were other than what God told them. But he took and caused them killed. That hard part's over with. Now it's chasing down those that are left and, and all. So um, the Midianites are on the run. Gideon, his army, they're chasing them. And those many nights are running, they're in fear. And yet they're heading straight towards the hands of the Ephraimites. They're heading that way. And as I shared with you last week and told you, uh, the Ephraimites captured and they killed two of the main princes of Midian. Um, they took and had captured uh, Zeb and Oram and they killed them. Those two princes is there. And they came, and whenever Gideon met up with the Ephraimites, uh, in order to prove that those two princes were dead, they showed uh, their heads. They brought their heads to them and all. So Ephraim did get involved, but it's after they were invited to come and do it and be involved with them. Well, the next thing we see is Ephraim starts complaining. Here they have, they've done something great, and they've complained. So that's the next thing we find find here. And here's what their complaint was. Here it was. Why didn't you ask us the help sooner? Why didn't you send word to us sooner? Why didn't you give us that personal invitation? Why didn't you come and ask us when you began all this to uh, come and help you then? Um, in fact, in one verse, it says they did chide with him sharply. They're arguing with Gideon. Why didn't you do this sooner? Why didn't you do that sooner? Why do you ask? Now that word chide means complain, debate, or contend. 
Can't you see the leaders of the Ephraimites there say, hey, we brought the heads down here of these two kings, these two princes, and we brought them down here. And why did, why did you wait to the last minute to invite us? They're, they're kind of arguing with them. Well, they really are arguing with them because the word that tells us uh, how, sharp, how, how this thing is, how serious this confrontation is, is that word sharply. Because see, that word sharply means vehemently or to scold. So this isn't a friendly conversation. It's not a time when it's just a couple of good old buddies. It's Ephraimite saying, hey, look what we've done. You could have called us sooner. We could have helped you sooner. But you didn't ask us. You didn't invite us. And uh, they're, they're upset. Um, you know, if it had been friends, they would say, hey, man, why didn't you tell me you needed some help? You know I'd come help you. All you had to do was let me know, but I didn't know. Well, that's not where Ephraim's at. Uh, they're upset. Um, Ephraim knew of the need. He, they knew of what was there before Gideon ever surrendered, surrounded the camp that night. Uh, they knew the Midianites had been coming and invading their crops and stealing their food and all. Um, you know, when I read about this, about Ephraim, I think of a person who knows your need or knows of a need around the church or, or whatever, uh, yet they don't get involved. They want you to ask them. They feel like, well, if they need me, they'll ask me in them all. Uh, well, that's not the way we need to be. You know, if you're a church member and, and you know of a need or a project, and I'm saying this, if you're of another church, you go somewhere else, not here at Kings Road, but if you're involved in a church and you're a part of that church and you know of a need or a project that is going on, in your church, don't wait for a special invitation. Don't wait for somebody to come along and say, hey, can you help us? What we ought to be saying all the time is, what can I do to help? We need to have that attitude. How can I help? What can I do? Let me help you. Let me get involved and, and do this. Uh, and, and, and you not be, be out there having to say, hey, I need help and begging for it. We need people just to say, what can I do to help? You know, I, I love it around our church when we have a dinner or some kind of social and we're trying to get ready for it and all, and people just come in and jump in. They'll set up tables, set up chairs. They'll start helping with setting the food up, getting the plates out. And all. I love it when people do that. I, I love it when there's another job. The other day around here, um, I took on a little project. I was going to do it myself. I hadn't asked any for help. I was just going to do it. <clears throat> didn't want anybody to really know who did the project or did anything. And I just was going to do it. And one of the uh, neighbors across the street, one of the men who uh, cleans and comes to church here, <clears throat> he saw me out there and come and just got involved. See, that's the way we need people to be. You see something happening in your church, something going on in a need, just do it. I tell our people, if you see a piece of paper on the ground, pick it up. Don't walk over it and let somebody else do it. Pick it up. Limbs around, lay it around, pick them up. Discard of them. Do this and do that. You see some trash inside the church, pick it up. You see the garbage that needs to be taken to the dumpster, just bag it and take it to the dumpster. Whatever we can do to help, let's not wait for an invitation for somebody to ask us in all. Uh, and let's just get involved. You know, one of the sad things I do see is that one person or a few people may even be this way who saw a need but didn't do anything and then later complained about it that they weren't asked to help. Folks, don't wait for a special invitation. Kings Road Baptist Church, here's your invitation. If you need an invitation to get involved in things, here's your invitation. You see something that needs to be done, then let's get it done. Let's do it. Let's be involved with it all. Don't be like the Ephraimites. Be involved when you see a need, and let's do it. Now, last, what I want you to see is how Gideon handled the situation with Ephraim. Now, I wrote this down. If Gideon had been a Baptist, well, I think of Gideon just being human. I think most of us are somewhat this way when we're confronted by somebody and a situation and all. Um, but he probably would argue back. If he'd been like most of us today, we want to argue back or we want to punch them in their nose or something like that. But he, um, Gideon handled it all different with the Ephraimites and all. Um, he handled it with wisdom. 
You know, that's why we need to handle situations. If there is somebody that's upset with you because you didn't ask them or whatever, uh, think about it before you respond. Have a little wisdom about how you handle things and all. And what Gideon did, he made the Ephraimites feel like they were the heroes of the battle. He made them feel great uh, for taking and uh, capturing and uh, killing these two princes. He made them feel great and all. And, uh, and, and in verse 3, he says, uh, what you've done is far greater than what we've done. Man, that little bat, that thing what we did last night was nothing compared to what you've done in, in all. And um, in the last part of verse 3, it says that their anger was abated toward him. In other words, they weren't mad at Gideon no more. Gideon made them feel good. Gideon made them feel like they were the heroes and that they did a great thing and, and took all the, uh, oh, look what I did. No, he took away the glory from himself and placed it on somebody else for what they did. In Proverbs 15, 1, it says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You see, we, we can give a soft answer. We can give a better answer instead of trying to stir up anger. Um, we don't always have to be heroes, folks. We don't need to be those heroes. We don't have to become angry. We don't have to handle that uh, just because somebody's angry with us. We don't have to say, well, I did this and you didn't help. We don't have to say, uh, where were you when I needed your help? We don't need those kind of things. What we need to do is when they step in and help, we need to be thankful. We need to say, thank you for helping. You know that. And if they're angry with us because we didn't ask them, uh, you know what? Look what they did. Say, man, listen, what you did was great. I appreciate it. I really, I'm thankful for it. So soft words can diffuse a bad situation in most cases. We can turn back and give uh, a good words to help people. Now, I hope we can learn that when there is a need that we don't wait for an invitation, that we just offer our services. That we'll say, how can I help? I, I love it when somebody comes along and says, Pastor, what can I do? How can I help you with this, Pastor? What can I do? Uh, then we're able to say, well, you know what? Thank you for offering. Here, here's our need. And can you do that? Can you help us with that? We also need to learn that we don't need the glory, but to let someone else have it. If, if it means avoiding a conflict, let them have the glory. I mean, what's it going to do you? I'm, in your heart, you may know what God's done, but what does it matter if they feel good? I'd rather them feel good than to lose a friend or to lose a church member or have a conflict. As Christians, we need to seek unity and not diversity, especially among the church. Folks, we need a unity in our churches today where our people are working together, where we've got the same mind and the same goals and moving in the same direction. So my prayer is that we can learn from Gideon and Ephraim uh, that we don't need to strive with one another. We don't need to be glory hogs. We don't need to be uh, that person that's always upset. We need to be willing and volunteering to help, and we need to be thankful for those that help us. Well, God bless you. Thank you for watching the program today, and I want to give you uh, have a word of prayer with you and uh, give you an invitation. Come be with us Sundays at 10 a.m. We're meetings at our church, social distancing. Uh, some have come back. Some of you still haven't made it to the service yet. Uh, if you still feel uncomfortable, please, we want you to stay home. We don't want you to come and feel uncomfortable. But things are going great uh, here and all. So we invite you to come be with us and be back in our service this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. in the Lord's house. Let me pray. Father, thank you for these moments in your word. Thank you for this little a uh, bit of a nugget that we can learn from here, Lord, out of your word. How that we can learn that uh, it's better to keep a friend and uh, make them heroes than it is to argue and fuss over something so minute. God, I ask you, Lord, also to help us, Father, that when we see a need that we'll get involved in help. And Lord, that we'll not be angry because we weren't personally asked, but we just see the need and we do it. Now, God, bless us this coming Sunday at 10 o'clock. I pray for a good crowd. I pray, Father, you continue to send us visitors our way. I pray, God, you'd send people into our church, Lord, to get involved 
and be a part of this work. And Lord, help us, God, to be uh, ready for when you sell this place and move, that we're ready to go into our new uh, ministry area and start serving there. God, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.